Good afternoon, everyone. How's that post Philly cheesesteak energy doing out there? Okay. Um, I appreciate Adrian, Katie, Jason for that last lightning round on issues that matter for working Americans. We're going to switch gears now. Don't change the channel. We're going to have a great panel about the intersection of media and the political landscape. And I don't think we could have three better people who have had a more uh, illustrative perch on this issue than who I'm about to introduce. The first is former president of CNN Worldwide, Jeff Zucker. Second, uh, former president MSNBC, Phil Griffin. And last but not least, uh, our co-host, uh, my pal, Michael Smirkanish, the host of, on Sirius XM and CNN. Thank you. You got Thank it. You. Go Thank you. Thanks I guess you're going to center. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing so far? Have we delivered on it? Okay. So it's a, it's a real privilege for me to have both of these gentlemen with me. A story you may have heard me explain on radio repeatedly is that there was a period in my life in the 2000s, I guess I would say, a five-year time period where I was the principal fill-in radio host for Bill O'Reilly on his Radio Factor. And I was the principal fill-in host for Chris Matthews on Hardball. And yeah, amazing to think about. And I would do my morning show, and then I would do O'Reilly's radio program, and then I would do Hardball. I used to joke that I would walk from the Fox News building on Avenue of the Americas to 30 Rock, and I wasn't sure if I was going to get shot in the chest or shot in the back as I was going between those worlds. Um, I very much wanted to have... It was the early 2000s, mind you. I very much wanted to have a television program of my own. I think the ego of it had consumed me. And there was no room at the inn at MSN. And Phil said to me one day, hey, if you get a gig elsewhere, I will let you out of your contract. And thankfully, that call came from Jeff. And I said, OK, now, there's one fly in the ointment. Phil needs to honor what he told me years ago, and you did. So both of whom hired and never fired me, thank you very much. <laughs> so that was, that was the good news. Here's the bad news. Gentlemen. That was the good news? Yeah, that was the good news. So I, I delivered on my radio program today an hour-long address. Kind oh, of the, so it was short for you. <laughs> the, world, the world according to me. It was my explanation of how we got into this polarized ditch, how we get out. And the short version is that I enumerated a number of causes, but at the top of my list is the media, sounding strange from someone who earns his keep behind a microphone. But I think among many factors, gerrymandering, self-sorting, lack of campaign finance reform. It's the polarized media and that there's causation, not correlation, between the two. Jeff, you're already shaking your head no. Yeah, well, shockingly, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, look, I think, that it, I think everybody's looking to blame somebody for why we're so polarized. And the media is the obvious, uh, easy target. The media is not perfect. But I don't think the media is why we're polarized. I think there's three main reasons why we're polarized. Uh, one involves the media. I think that's Rupert Murdoch. That's one. Two, I think it's social media, where you can anonymously uh, attack uh, your opponents. Uh, and three is gerrymandering, where people can go to Congress uh, and never really have to compromise or talk to the people on the other side of the aisle uh, and can then just appear on Fox News or uh, MSNBC or wh whatever their favorite outlet is without ever having to, uh, uh, to consult or, or, or compromise. And look, I think those are the three biggest uh, issues uh, why we're so polarized today. I don't think it's, I think the media is a reflection of our polarization. I don't think it's the cause of our polarization. When you say Murdoch, you mean Fox? Largely, I do. Okay. Yes. Not CNN, not MSNBC, Fox. Yeah. I mean, I think Fox might be the most culpable, but no culpability on the part of the others? I think I started by saying that, that, that we're not perfect by any stretch. The media, you know, there's a lot of issues with the media, I acknowledge. But 
you know, I don't think that by and large as a business proposition day in and day out, CNN or MSNBC is, is uh, pushing misinformation and disinformation and uh, uh, as a business model uh, upon which their entire premise is built, which is really harming America. And I don't think that's happening at CNN or MSNBC. By the way, I, I, of course, Phil's going to respond. I, I don't believe that misinformation and disinformation are pushed by the outlets that you two represent. Well, but I think it is pushed by the other. But I think, but I think a perspective, an attitude, an ideology has been pushed in the past. What do you think? Well, I'm going to begin to just ask you, when do you think that this divide yeah. began? Uh, okay, I'll give you a benchmark. 1988 is when Rush Limbaugh was put into national syndication. And in the mid-90s, when Fox News came online, Roger Ailes, a one-time television producer for Limbaugh, took that playbook and brought it to Fox. Here's, here's my telling of this. MSNBC struggled for a while. You remember Phil Donahue was the guy who couldn't get traction. And all of a sudden, I think you said, hey, here's what we need to do. We need to not go as far as Fox goes, but we need to do from the left what they've been doing to the right. That's the short version. But I think, but if you look at Rush Limbaugh and you look at the beginning of Fox, there were already the audience for that. And it had been there for some time. So when you say that the media is responsible or a good part of it is a good part of the the, the, the um, divide. I just want to know where you begin it, because I think it goes way back. Where would you begin it? 1776. <laughs> <laughs> and we are here in Philadelphia. So uh, America, by the way, America is not a homeland. It's been, it's been bastardized to be called a homeland. America is an idea. And that idea is that all people are equal, freedom, they have freedom, and they have opportunity. It was in conflict from the beginning the way America uh, grew up. We were in total conflict. We had this idea of America and what America was. And for 240 some odd years, we've been struggling with that. So when I look at the middle, or I look at how the divide happened and how we can close it, we got to figure out are we going to be that country, that idea, that no better place to be talking about this than Philadelphia? Or are we going to argue about the reality and the petty jealousies and the issues that have come up over 200 years from slavery, through the Civil War, through the 1924 Immigration Act, through neo-Nazis, through white nationalists, all the way to today? So to say that the media, which has reported on this and covered it, is responsible for it when it's so much deeper and ingrained in our country, I don't understand. But I, I don't believe that political power today rests with the parties. Nobody gives a damn who the head of the RNC or the DNC are. It's the cable outlets that are setting the tone. Let me say one other thing about this. In the 1980s, you know, the so-called Ronald Reagan go-go years of the 80s, 60% of the House and Senate was comprised of moderates. 60%. There were so many Republican Senate moderates, they had a caucus of their own. They called it the Wednesday Lunch Club. So when I chart on a, on a graph the changes I see in the media with an increase in polarization in Washington, I don't even say correlation. I say causation. Yeah, but what, all, what happened after the, the, the 1980s? Fox News. Right. Social media. Right. Gerrymandering. I agree with all of those factors, uh, Jeff, absolutely. Although, I have to tell you, that there's something else, gerrymandering's a problem. Uh, we need to professionally draw boundary lines. But the number of blowout counties, and we don't redraw county boundary lines, has grown exponentially in the last 30 years. So what does that reflect? Self-sorting. People are living among the like-minded. We've got to get out of our bubbles, and we've got to change the channel. Whatever the channel is you're watching, you've got to change it. Phil? Well, I, I tend to think that um, cable news gets an inordinate amount of attention for the smaller audiences that they have. Albeit, they're powerful. They're, they're mainstream media. I get it. But, you know, there's the New York Times, there's the Wall Street Journal, there are plenty of other media outlets that help create whatever you want to talk about the media. Um, but I look back, I, you know, to 1988, I go way before that. You know, until really the late 60s, 
most, a good chunk of America had no representation in the media. So it changed dramatically when finally, with the advent of technology in the 80s, all of a sudden we had cable, we had, we had you know, opportunity to see other people with ESPN, with MTV, with, with all the, the explosion of media that took place in 1980. And more people had voices. And as more people had voices, that, that issue I talked about in the beginning, about the idea of America and the reality, was, it's challenged. I think never before have we had so much choice and so few of us are exercising it. Like, you're right, the no, internet exploded, that is a, that satellite is, and radio. It's, and it's negative and it's positive. But the question is, is the world better today with all the voices that are out there, good and bad, or was it better when many of the voices were suppressed? And I think much of the change in America, that divide has happened as more people have stood up and we recognize more people, whether it is people of color, whether it is the gay community, whether it's immigrants, whether it's people who want their share of the American dream. And I think that changed, uh, changed us as much as anything. You want to Yeah, and I, look, I, I also don't want to pretend like the media is not perfect, okay? I mean, so I'm not trying to say that the media doesn't deserve some of the responsibility here. That, that, you know, I just think it's very easy to go to the media first, which is what you did. But does the media bear some responsibility? Of course, of course. And, and we shouldn't, you know, just accept the fact that the, the media doesn't contribute to, to some of the issues that we have. But I think everybody goes to, it's the media's fault for this and the media's fault for that. And okay, I mean, we, we do deserve some, we, we, do, we should take some responsibility for sure. How about this? 42% of Americans tell Gallup they are not D's they are not ours, they, have, they are eyes. And I think a lot of them are represented here and virtually watching us. Jeff Zucker, can you sell centrism? I sold you, <laughs> so. <laughs> but why, why not, why not say, hey, this is the path. We're not going to be MSNBC. We're not going to be Fox. We are going to go after independent thinkers. And I don't just mean me on Saturday, right? I mean, we're going to build a whole network around that principle. So could you give examples of that? Because I really don't quite understand it. And, and, and I do want to say I'm, I'm defending the media, but the media makes mistakes. And they do, and we are, should be, and are held accountable when we do. Most of us are held accountable. But give me examples of what a centrist um, network or newspaper that, that, that doesn't exist today, what, what would that be like? Well, it'll sound self-congratulatory to talk about this because I think I'm well suited for it. Yeah. And this is, and this is no, not, this is not but self- But I, I agree, I agree. But you know, there, you know the, the reality is there's not 25 of you. Is, but, I mean, is that the problem? There aren't enough people who are in this territory? Who are, who are good and capable broadcasters like yourself, you know, I mean, look, the, the other thing is, I mean, we're being, we're, we're, we're being a little flippant, but you do represent what that network would be built around. Now, would, would that network succeed? I don't know. Why? Because passion doesn't rest in the middle? Well, I mean, truly, I, mean, I, think, I think there's a lot of passion here, but, you know, I mean, the, the reality is, uh, I don't think there's enough good people like you to, to fill out that network, and I'm not sure that there's enough, uh, um, you know, day in, day out passion to, to have that succeed, but it's certainly a noble idea and, and worth, uh, worth trying to do, but there's not enough good people like you, for instance, to, to fill out that network. What do you think? Not about uh, me, but no, about no. the, the I, principle. I, I, I no, but what do you think uh, about Michael? I, I love Michael. I love Michael, and I wish he hadn't gone to CNN. Um, but here, let me ask you a question. Big issue, yeah. 2020 election. 2020 election. Some people think it was fraudulent. Right. Corrupt. Yeah. Some people think that the United States may be one of the worst countries in the world in putting on election because they, they deceive the voter. Other people say, well, I've seen all the court's rulings, both in red states and blue states. It's a legitimate election. On your so-called middle-of-the-road channel, would you have that debate? Yes. 
I don't and think would you, you have guess? Would you put people I would, on? I wouldn't have it as a debate. Would I? I'm, I'm not going to ignore it, though, Jeff. I no, wouldn't no, no. Ignore I, oh, no. You can report on this issue, but would you have the debate? I wouldn't treat one side with parity of the other. Right. But I wouldn't totally ignore it. Agreed. Agreed. So you'd put on somebody who says the 2020 election is fraudulent. And I, as a journalist, better take them on. But yes, I would. Why, and, why, uh, why, well, hold on. Why, why, why are you giving them that platform? Because if I'm looking at data that says Republicans believe this, I feel like I'm not doing my job unless I well, air it I, I, in a critical way. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree, but I mean... I mean I, Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, I think this is the interesting question about getting at your whole thing. Uh, you know, there are two sides to, there are two sides, you're talking about centrism. There are two sides to whether marijuana should be legal at the federal level. Okay, you can have that debate. There are two sides to whether student debt should be forgiven. There, you know, you can have that debate. There's not two sides to whether or not the 2020 election was legit. Okay. Okay. I agree. But, but if, that, if that position is held by so many, do we not address it? No, I mean, I, or, or just ignore but, it? But I think we've got to find out the roots of why that, that is believed. Uh, the latest poll, I think, is 61% of Republicans believe that the election was illegitimate. That's because the leaders who are pushing that have gotten plenty of airtime on certain outlets to push that idea. I think it is dangerous to put somebody on when, as a journalist, you should be seeking out the truth. I do think we have to bring attention to it. We have to say 70% of Republicans or 60% of Republicans believe the 2020 election was illegitimate. But then I want to bring on experts who know around the country what the courts have done, the systems have done, has there been any corruption of voting systems. And when you find out, no, there hasn't, it is our role to educate people that this isn't true. I get nervous when the issue becomes one of, are we even going to allow this on our airways? I, I, allow I was, what? Uh, allow the people uh, who allow, you know are liars? Allow, allow subjects that are steeped in controversy that you may think are bullshit. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. I believe, they know this because I talked about it on air, I think that the Hunter laptop was worthy of more airing than it received right before the election. Either of you agree with me on that? Do you regret, do you regret, how about if I ask it this way specifically, do you regret not dealing with it before the election? Well, I mean, I think, I think we, the question is, we did deal with it, but to the degree that, you know, you would, you would have thought was appropriate. I think the answer is in the, in the final two weeks, you know, it was looked at. We did not know enough about it. There was not, you know, there was not within two weeks of the election, the ability when the messenger on that story was Rudy Giuliani, okay? No, I mean, but I mean, that, that's the problem. It's like, you're gonna give a lot of legitimacy to Rudy Giuliani delivering, you know, he's got the goods. So part of the issue with that story was who was delivering the goods, okay? That's one. That doesn't mean that we didn't look into it. We did, we did look into it. But first of all, you know, with regard to the son of the candidate, you know, he was the son of the candidate. He wasn't the candidate. The question that you'll come back with is, well, but what role did the candidate play in, in his business dealings? You know, frankly, uh, with 10 days or two weeks to go, uh, there, it was looked at by very credible organizations, including the Wall Street Journal, Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal, and they found nothing at that time, okay? So my point is, it's easy to say, we should have spent more time on that. Listen, do I think it's legitimate to look at? Sure, do I think that like, it's, it's a legitimate criticism to say that in the 10 days, 14 days prior to the election, you didn't spend enough time on it? Not really. What do you think? Um, he was never arrested. Uh, the Justice Department was looking into it, never reported it until he is the son of a candidate. I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a main story until that happens. Now, we looked into it, you know, NBC News did. Um, uh, Tom Winter and uh, uh, Ken DeLorean did a great job. They met with Rudy. He brought a couple of pages printed out from the so-called, uh, from, the, from the computer. Um, they asked for a digital copy of it. They didn't get it. 
but I don't think it was a big story before the election because he was never found, he was never charged with it. Hey, Michael, let me ask you, in the two weeks before the election, when that came out, I don't remember the exact yeah, timing. Yeah, I think 11 days yeah. before. 11 day, okay, 11 days. So you probably had two shows uh, prior to the election on CNN, right? Right, one, it, but two, yeah. Well, okay, whatever. Did you cover it? No. I talked did, about did, it. Hold on, I, hold on. Did I tell you not to cover it? Definitely not. Okay. Did I, uh, so did hold on, I hold talk on, hold about on, it? Hold on. Why didn't you cover it? I talked about it extensively on, I guess, part no, of No, 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 no. We're not talking about radio. We're talking about CNN. I'm going I'm okay. to give you an answer. Okay. So I, my I, point I, is, though, you're giving, you're, you know, you're, you're saying you had the opportunity to do it, and you didn't do it. I regret it. Okay. I regret it. I but talked why? about it. I, I, wait, I, I talked about it extensively on radio, but no, Jeff's right. I didn't. And and I second guess myself now. I, I don't think it's a huge story. Right. I don't think it's a huge story. But I think I look bad by not talking about it at all. I should have said something about the damn issue. That's what I'm talking about. Did you? But you didn't know all the facts at the time either. No, but I think that we looked partisan by not giving it some air. Yeah, I think you got to. I, I, I don't. I don't disagree with that. But I think you have to be careful to just because somebody throws a, a smoke bomb into the arena uh, to, you know, I think, yeah, listen, it is, a, it is worth real examination. But, you know, in the, in the 11 days prior to the election, it involves the son of a candidate, uh, you know, who clearly has issues and troubles. You know, what is the extent to which you should do it? We, we reported on it, but we didn't report on it to the degree that you're saying you thought w uh, would have been proper. Okay, that, that's, that's fine. Do you regret giving Trump as much air as you gave him in 2016? Of course I do. I've admitted this publicly. Uh, I, I've said so. You know, now, I don't believe that's why he became president of the United States. It's like, you know, I, I had a lot of power, but I didn't have that much power. Um, and, and so, yes, of course, I, I, think that, that, uh, I think that we made a mistake. Uh, and Did you then try to compensate for it thereafter? Uh, and what's I don't understand the by question. By giving him a hell of a lot less or by changing the well, way Well, but then he was president of the United States. Right, so, but, you know. but, but there, there seemed to have been a tonal shift after his election. Is that fair? Yeah, in the, in the week after he was elected, you know, he, he, he tried to discredit, uh, you know, the entire media and, and CNN in particular. And, uh, and you know, we, we, as I said all the time, we, we, you know, we were not anti-Trump. We were pro-truth. If that came off as anti-Trump because he didn't tell the truth, that's, that's, I'm not going to apologize for that. Okay. How do you, so, how do you balance that which will get you ratings, i.e. someone like Trump? I mean, people would say to me all the but time. But we didn't go out and, and say, hey, Mr. Trump, will you run for office because no, no, we, no, no. we need ratings? No, I no. Mean, but I, I want to I tell you this. I, I often, people would say to me in 2016, oh, your network, why are they giving him that much air time? And my response was to say, I would say, if you're walking through your living room and on the television she's on, meaning Hillary, or he's on, meaning Trump, which one are you stopping to watch? And the answer was always Trump, because I don't know what the hell he's going to say. And I said, well, okay, but how do you balance what the public might really want to watch versus protecting democracy? Like, Phil, what you were saying, hey, if, if, if they're spreading lies, well, what do you we, do? We, we stopped airing them way early. Part of it is our audience said, we don't want to hear this. This is not appropriate material. He is, he is not living up to the standards of America. And we stopped. And when Trump started doing the COVID press conferences. We showed them for a while, but then we ended up watching them and then cutting out the pieces where there was new information so that there couldn't be misinformation put out on how to treat it and all the other things that he was saying. I think it's the responsibility of a journalist to, to seek the truth solely. You can talk about, you should report on everything that's going on. But I don't think it's your responsibility to give a platform, even to the President of the United States, if the President of the United States is, not, is, is lying or is misleading people or not telling the truth about something for his own end. So I disagree a little bit with Phil on the second point about 
you know, he, he was the President of the United States. And, uh, you know, I think to, to uh, if he's speaking and lying when he's speaking or is passing along misinformation, you know, he's still the President of the United States. And I do, I do think that there's a, a little bit of uh, a responsibility to cover the President of the United States. Um, for instance, you know, when the broadcast networks did not cover Biden's speech from here uh, about the threat to democracy, I think there was a responsibility to cover that, actually, I think, and I think they should have. Um, so, so I think that it's the responsibility of the journalists immediately But you did after. make the decision later not to air the Trump press conferences on COVID. We did? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, never mind. Um, I don't remember, but you know. Zuckerberg says that Facebook was visited by the FBI prior to 2020 to serve notice, hey, you know, misinformation may be coming. Uh, to each of you, do you recall such a warning, CNN or MSNBC, from the feds? Never. No. Never happened. I wonder, I wonder why. Well, I, my guess is that I think, I, I, I don't, you know, obviously it never happened here. Um, my guess is that, that they probably saw that, that that social platform that I talked about in my first answer to you was being used for uh, uh, the spread of misinformation and disinformation in, in ways that were unique to that platform. Uh, I, I'm assuming, I, I don't know, okay? Um, and I think that, you know, on our digital properties, and you know, at the time, CNN was the biggest digital property in the world, um, news and information uh, property, uh, you know, that anything that was there was verified, right? So, so I think it's different. I would agree. I, I want to go back to a question. Um, interesting that we've had this discussion now for uh, close to half hour. Not long enough. And Politicians haven't been brought up. Okay, what do you want to say about politicians? Where do they fall into this, the great divide and the cause of it? Okay, because, according, according you know, to me? Politicians and, and leaders, of uh, political thought leaders. Right. Um, where do they This fall? is good. I, I like interviewing you. Okay, <laughs> according, <laughs> according to me, they're getting their marching orders from you, and I mean the two that, of you. That, that is. And I, 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 let me finish the thought. They do because. Who's interviewing who here? <laughs> because, because you know, you control primary voters. The, there, there's a gentleman in the back of the room from a Harrisburg affiliate, and he interviewed me earlier today. I don't know where he is, and he said to me, he has a hard time getting the Pennsylvania candidates on his newscast. Why? They would rather go to MSNBC or they would rather go to Fox because they know they're going to reach their base. And because of closed primaries, nine states like Pennsylvania, it's all about motivating, not persuading. And that's one of the things we're here to discuss. Well, I, I, would, I would disagree with you that all Republicans go on Fox. President Obama, and when he was candidate Obama, came on our air over eight years once with Rachel Maddow the weekend before the 2008 election, and once with Morning Joe before the 2012 election. That is it. We were not the home for democratic thought. And why was he afraid to come on, or why didn't he come on? I don't know if he was afraid. I think he was going to be held accountable. And it's really serious and deep way. Every Republican who gets in trouble runs to Fox News and gets their voice heard. But I would argue, to going back to my initial question, Pat Buchanan ran for president in 1992. He basically said we are losing our white Euro ethnicity, ethnicity in the United States and this was going to be bad for the country and we had to do something about it. He was a leader to many people. He won the New Hampshire primary. I don't think MSNBC or Fox News or CNN told Pat to say that. And I'm saying this is at the time, I was a big fan of Pat, and I was shocked by his book. But that's what he said. 
And there has been that thread in American history of just that. And many leaders get that because they find out that there's power in creating fear, in creating anger, in making people feel that the world is against them, and, it's, and it can, you can make the government feel that you're against you, and media feel against you, and the East Coast elites. But I think this has been pushed by political leaders for well over 25 years. Going back to Ronald Reagan, who was anti-government. Government is not good. At a time when government was doing things to make sure that people of color and minorities got more opportunities. So I think this is a very difficult subject to talk about. Media, yes, there's been an explosion of media, and it's been for good and for bad. But I still think most of media reflects what's going on in the country and what our leaders are doing. Let's, let's talk about what should be done, not just relative to the media, but you're surrounded by 750 people who have traveled great distances. Spokane, Washington, by the way, you win. You came the furthest. Um, and I, I, think, I think I can speak for them in that they're not happy. You know, we're not happy with the status quo. We feel like there's over-representation in the media and in Washington and in state legislatures by the most partisan among us. And, like, we're not. And the people who are in my orbit, and you may say it's a reflection of where I live, but they're, they're fiscally conservative and they're socially progressive. And I think that's most of the country. Like, how do we get a voice? I agree. I, I agree with you that, that those are the issues we should be talking about. But what are the key issues that we hear about right now that politicians are talking about? Well, if it were the Democrats, it would be uh, abortion. If it were the Republicans, it would be crime and borders and inflation. And immigrants. Yeah. And, and the 2020 election. The stolen election. Yes. Right. Right. Yep. So would you, would you say this, that, in main, that somehow in conservative media, there's been a sense that there's more misinformation being put out there than in mainstream mainstream media. I'm not sure what, what, what I don't understand. For lies, that you're finding this, the, 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 many of the issues of the day are being lied about in, main, in, in conservative media right. in ways it isn't in other mainstream media. Phil, I'm, I'm not here. I need to be very clear about this. I'm not here arguing that there's parity between the left and the right in the media, because I don't believe that. Right. I think right. there's outsized influence in the hands of Fox News, and a hell of a lot of misinformation has been put out there, so much so that today in the Washington Post, they say that a majority of Republican candidates who won right. senatorial, congressional, gubernatorial, believe the election was stolen. Right. That's, that, that's the slate of candidates. Right. So it's not, I don't see parity, but I, I do see this ideological bias that I don't think is reflective of the country. That's where I'm coming from. Right. Yeah, well, I, th I think I, I agree with you, uh, Michael, and so, like, what can be done? I, I mean, I go back to, uh, you know, I think that, uh, frankly, you should have a bigger platform and there should be more people who express, you know, I, I think it's, as long as there's not, uh, you gotta hold both sides accountable. I agree. And, and, and Kick the shit out of both sides. Agreed. Okay? Yeah. But you got to recognize that on some things, both sides are not, are not the same. Also Okay? Agreed. And yeah. so as long as, as long as we start from there that, you know, going back to what I said before, there's not two sides to every story. And so you can kick the, kick the crap out of, out of both sides. I think that's the role uh, uh, of you and, and others uh, in the media, hold both sides accountable but recognize that on certain issues like democracy and, you know, and, and, uh, and the future of democracy and whether the election was stolen, there's not two sides. And we sit here looking at Independence Hall and there's no more important uh, story in America today than preserving democracy. I agree with that, the way that you've said it. Yeah, I agree. Um, for, for Jeff, you know him better than anyone. I mean, you gave him his second career. Here we right? go. <laughs> no, I, but I, oh, no. I, I yeah. like you, you, you understand <laughs> yeah. the guy. Oh, now you're interviewing too? <laughs> you, you get him. Yes. What's he up to? Is he running? And how should he be covered if he does? 
Well, um, look, uh, I assume that uh, Trump is going to run. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're teasing me, but I don't know. But I assume that he will run. Um, and, uh, and I think we know a lot more today than we did in 2016 and a lot more than we knew in 2020. And I think that, you know, we have to take into account that, uh, you know, he's done a lot to undermine uh, democracy. And, uh, and that has to be taken into account in the coverage if he becomes a candidate. And I don't think that anybody can be afraid of that or pull any punches. And, uh, and I do worry about that, uh, that the media um, won't, uh, won't be as vigorous as it should be with regard to that. I can attest to the fact that you were very hands-on when you ran CNN often in the control room. I have many memories of election nights where I would be one of those panelists and you know, you'd be there um, putting your imprint on the coverage. What would you do if, if, if you were running CNN or some other network and he announced and he's out on the trail and he's doing a rally and, and it's good for ratings maybe because people on a Saturday night yeah, want to yeah. watch I it. Mean, I, okay, let me just one thing. I mean, I think it's easy from the outside. Everybody says you do everything for ratings. That's, that's not what... So, so what, what's the mindset? What's the... the, the well, I mean, listen, if, if he's the... Here's the thing. If he is the... Going back to your, your, what we talked about earlier, that you do have to cover what, you know, is one of the predominant storylines in America, if people believe things. You know, if he is the leading contender for the Republican nomination, then, you know, then that is an enormous story. And you cannot ignore it. Okay? So... If, if it's out there on a, on a Saturday afternoon and he's, uh, you know, I mean, again, we learned our lesson. I wouldn't take his rallies and things like that uh, live uh, like we did in 2016. But I think we still have to report on it and we, we have to hold him accountable. And, you know, you got to call things for what they are. And if he lies, you got to call it a lie. And I think that, you know, too often in the media, we're afraid to, to say what things are, you know? And, uh, and I think that you have, to, you have to be honest about it. You have to be journalistically sound about it. But you have to also, you know, call things for what they are. Talk to me about Trump, Phil. Um, I think that our audience, let's just say I was still at MSNBC. I don't know what they'll do now. Um, of course we're going to report on it. I mean, that's not, that's not right. in debate here. It's the question of how much airtime we're going to give them and the analysis that we're going to do afterwards. Smart, informed, thoughtful analysts of stuff that he's done before. I doubt we'd give him much airtime if he's talking about, you know, both sides when he's in Charlottesville um, are good people. Um, I don't think we'd put him on if he is talking or giving uh, some sort of recognition of the Proud Boys or, or other groups that have supported him. But um, obviously, if he's going to be the candidate, you're going to have to spend time with him. And I would put him on. Uh, there are a lot of people who will lie that I don't think we should put on because I don't think that it is our job to give a platform to them. Our job is to find the truth. But if he is the candidate of the Republican Party, we've got to put him on and we have got to talk to him and then we have got to do a full analysis of what he says. In the midst of COVID, we have a second home. In the midst of COVID, our daughter and son-in-law evacuated Brooklyn and moved into that second home. I came to that property weeks after they moved in and turned on the television and I, I couldn't find CNN because they cut the cord. Your kids had. Yeah, they'd cut the cord. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. So I, I did, did they know you were still on CNN? I don't know. I, I don't know. Apparently not. May, well, that, that might have been the reason, but, you, you know, know. But I, anyway, I, I went rip shit. You know, like, where's the cable? How do you think the mortgage gets paid? Um, <laughs> where are we going? Where are we going with all this cord cutting? Not to your second house. No. Um, <laughs> Well, look, cord cutting is real, uh, and 
you know, uh, five years ago, CNN and MSNBC and, and Fox were in 92 million homes in, in this country. Uh, today, that number is down to around 70 million. And in, in the next five years, that'll be down to 50 million. Now, two things. 50 million is still a significant number. Right. But it is, you know, almost 50% of what it, what it was, right? But, you know, let's acknowledge that 50 million is still significant. Um, but I think that where we're going is all of these uh, uh, outlets are going to have to have in addition to that, that linear distribution, they're going to have to have a direct-to-consumer relationship with the people here and the audience, and, and they'll have to have uh, a, a different way of distributing MSNBC or CNN or, uh, or whatever outlet you're talking about. So I think we're going to much fewer homes, um, but still being able to receive these kind of outlets on different platforms? I think the fear, and, and I, they're going to survive in some way. Are they? Well, I, I, I think that people will want content. But it is becoming so financially expensive, and how much money they pull in will determine how much they can do. We're seeing this in local newspapers around the country, that as, you know, digital and uh, takes over and the technology changes, um, they don't get the ad support because it's easier to sell a car on, you know, autocar.com. Um, newspapers have lost a huge stream of revenue, and what, 30% of the newspapers or more have gone out of business already. Many are all digital, but what's happening worse is they're losing reporters, and they're not covering their own city hall, and they're not covering. And so what I worry about the future is just to make sure there are these large platforms or whatever method it is that it comes out for these journalistic enterprises, because we've got to hold not only the president accountable, but we've got to hold the mayor accountable, we've got to hold the city council accountable, and, and the decisions that are made at every level of politics. I make this point all the time that anytime you read a story about a, a newsroom being eviscerated, you should worry, because there are fewer people now keeping an eye on government at, at all levels. Holding but, everybody accountable. But I don't know what the model is that's going to allow that, because no amount of bloggers, I think, are going to fill that void. Well, I mean, listen, new models will have to develop and, uh, and you know, there is, there is great journalism happening everywhere. It's just at very, in very different places and, and, uh, and new models are going to have to develop over the next five years. You know, I just want to go back to something we were talking about before, the role of media and what, what we should do. You know, I, I actually think that media organizations uh, uh, should stand for something and I think above everything else, they should stand for the truth. And, and then beyond that, uh, you know, I think they should be pro-truth. I think they should be pro-democracy. I, I think we should, we, we should want to live in a society that promotes democracy. And I think we should be pro-science and, and, you know, believe in fact. And I think they're all related, you know. Science is fact, and that's truth. And I think that if we're, if we're driven by being pro-truth uh, and pro-science, and pro-democracy, then, then, then I think media will be, will be good. I'm going to ask you each in a moment for a final 60-second thought for the audience. I just gave you one. <laughs> then you're done. Oh, okay. You can... um, li listen, I, I want to say this. The, the two of you do not come out to play, so I'm really grateful so, so, that you're here. I well, mean that. Well, hold on. Hold wait, on. wait, wait, wait. Uh, I just want everybody to know. I, lo I love Michael Smirconish too, but I didn't realize that I had to say it 10 times in order to get everybody here. <laughs> no, well, the reality is, well, I'm going to say I love him again. But anyway, the reality is, uh, you know, uh, I left CNN in February, and um, I haven't talked to a single person since I left. And, uh, wow. and so uh, I said yes because it's you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do either of you want to make news today by discussing a next chapter in your professional lives? Well, he's got a great chapter going. You know, I just got back from Italy. I was in France. I went golfing out in California. But um, <laughs> I, 
I, I am working with Rachel Maddow on a production company outside of her work at MSNBC. Uh, she just is dropping um, a new podcast, which I think everybody should listen to, called Ultra, which will come out on Monday. It is about um, 1944, um, uh, 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 the, the, in 1944, the sedition trial, when many um, sort of radical Americans um, gathered with Congress, with some members of Congress, to um, over to overthrow the government and put an authoritarian government. This happened in the United States in the 30s and 40s. And she's going to put a spotlight on that. Um, obviously, it resonates um, with some of the actions we've seen today. So that drops on, um, on, on Monday. That is a NBC. It's not part of our production company, but I want it to do well because who knows what we'll do with it afterwards. But anyway, that's what I'm doing, but I'm also enjoying myself. Um, you know, when I worked in media, it is full time, and uh, my wife's here. She held the family together. She held everything together. I did spend as much time as I could with my kids, but I realized when I'm out of it that my world just blossoms because there's so much else I've been doing. That's and, so, any announcements, Jeff? That's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Um, you work Corey in there. That was I did. Nice. Unless he's here, I've got yeah. it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no announcements for you, Michael. I, uh, I, I, I've, uh, I've had almost no time off in the last 35 years, and uh, it's actually been uh, really nice uh, to uh, have a little, little downtime. And uh, I'm looking forward to another chapter, but n just not quite yet. Not yet. Uh, a final thought from each of you could be 10 seconds for the unconvention here in Philadelphia. By the way, thank you Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you, Unite America. What wonderful partners we have had to put this on today. I really appreciate it. Bill? Uh, I, I love this discussion and I could talk about it. There's so many different ways to go about it. But the bottom line is um, let's hope that that conflict that's been in America between the idea of America and what it's been can, instead of having that gap get bigger, can close up. And that's what media should do by seeking out the truth. And if we do it, hopefully, in, in years to come, that divide will go away. Jeff Zucker. I mean, I, th I, I think we, cover, we, cover, we covered a lot of ground today, and, uh, and it was great to be with Phil, and it was great to be with you, Michael. And I would just say, Look, I think this is a really, really critical time in American history, and, um, and we should not take for granted what happened in that building down there, because uh, 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 when it goes, it goes. And uh, if the media isn't there to, uh, to stand up for what's right and what's truthful, then, uh, then, there, will, then there, there won't be anything left. So I think that uh, at the end of the day, uh, holding all sides accountable, but understanding that not all, all, all sides are always the same, uh, and being, uh, standing up for truth and standing up for democracy has never been more important. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.